Welcome to the Normal Not Normal podcast with myself, James Phelps. And me, Oliver Phelps. And in this series, we're talking to some of our favourite people to find out what normal means to them and to ask, well, does normal even exist? And today we're so excited to be talking to somebody that we've known for a very long time. A good friend of ours and probably the entertainment industry's leading costume designer, Jani Tamim. Now, she's worked on six of the eight Harry Potter films coming on in the third film, The Prisoner of Azkaban. And she's also known for her work in Skyfall and Spectre, the James Bond films, Gravity with George Clooney and Sandra Bullock, just to name a few. Yeah, and obviously we're so happy to be speaking to Jani and we hope you guys really enjoy the conversation and learning stuff about the uh, the whole costume side of things that even we didn't really know to be honest with you so we hope you have an amazing time in today's show uh, but just a quick one right so going back obviously last week's episode the fan interaction episode thank you for your participation in there if you were featured but there was also um we obviously mentioned the the reunion and it's quite funny how in recent weeks um Obviously, the reunion came out, and I'm sure everyone really, really enjoyed it, because we did. It was great actually being part of it. Um, but a few things happened, right? So I put this... I was, I was watching it, and I, and I noticed that the title editor had got our quite, names. Quite a few people noticed this faux pas well, they, as well. They did, yes. Uh, got our names the wrong way round, which I was kind of a bit like... Well, I'll be honest with you, I was, pretty, I was pretty annoyed with it. But how you can make a good thing from a, a bad situation type thing is make a bit of a lightheartedness about it so i put a, a message out on on instagram of it and uh yeah it went pretty viral which is quite a nice thing i suppose um and they did they did change it i assume i i found out later from someone telling me that they changed it but anyway um but i just want to i just want to address something that unfortunately stuff like that happens to twins all over the world um, that people can't be bothered to just check what's going on properly. Whether they're in a rush to do stuff, I don't know. So we're not saying that anyone did anything deliberately. But what I would suggest is that stuff like this happens. It's happened to us before. It'll probably happen to us again. But it probably happens to a lot of other identical twins out there all over the world. So if you are listening to this and you've got like a group of twins um, who you know, there's like a set of twins who you know, or they're doing something uh, in maybe a production or something like that or an office space or something like that. Make sure, for crying out loud, you get the right name under the right person or you talk to them separately because there's nothing more bloody annoying than people just going like, "Uh, it'll be all right. How many times have we we turned up to to do a a job and if we're staying in a, a different location or in a hotel, we get there and they've only booked one hotel room with twin beds where everyone else has got the their own or we're sharing a trailer sharing a or trailer. something like that and everybody else isn't and it's just a bit frustrating every so often i was really happy to see as well everyone else's reactions as well to it so thank you very much for for well, yeah being that as way it should be everybody that was nice fun um but yeah thank you very much for that and um i think we spoke all, all we needed to about the reunion last week um but thank you very much for everybody for having our back in that regard but back to our chat with Jani. It was wonderful to catch up with her and revisit some amazing costumes that she put together for us in all of the Harry Potter films that she was a part of. She's an amazing person to work with, very funny. So without much further ado, here's Jani. Bonjour, Jani, ça va? Bonjour, James, ça va? <laughs> it's the first time I hear you speaking French. In 10 years, you never spoke French to me. And now you do. <laughs> you did grow. <laughs> I've been practicing so hard. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jani. I know you've got a very tight schedule at the moment, but we really do appreciate it. So I thought I'd just quickly explain what our podcast is about. So it's called Normal Not Normal, and it's celebrating the differences and trying to figure out what the word normal means to everybody. Okay. Uh, so as, as I'm sure everybody knows, we met on the set of the Harry Potter films where you were working on dressing a lot of witches and wizards, which probably isn't the most normal task in the world for people. But I remember the first time we met was at our first costume fitting for the Prisoner of Azkaban. <gasps> and I still remember to this day that the costume that was decided was the ones for the Marauder's Map scene, which was um, kind of like Oliver and my first big scene in the whole series so it was quite a quite a build up to it and it was such a fun process of going through and I, 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 I will always remember that day going in and meeting you for the first time um, but I have, I have to say my favourite costume of the entire series that Fred and George had 
was the suits in the sixth film yes. um, for the Weasley Wizard Wheezers. Well, I must say that um, is one of my best costume for you both. It mm. was maybe the end one, but it was the one that I prefer of all of them. Although we had some little beauties. I remember the, the sweater with the check, the shirt. We, we had some little beauties because we could really yep. let go with you both. I remember having so much fun dressing you both and dressing Rupert. I enjoyed the Weasley tremendously because with the Weasley, we could really go crazy. Remember, we did some beauties. <laughs> I mean, every time I, I was fitting you or fitting Ron, in a way, I was feeling very sorry. <laughs> because, <Yeah. laughs> because I was giving you ideas things, but you were always so willing to wear them. You were so enthusiastic about every single horror I could give you. That was so nice. <laughs> I think playing those characters especially, they were very much, they made do with what was coming at them. And it, it was just nice that we could actually see them almost yeah, yeah, yeah. getting away from, cause especially from the third movie onwards, the style changed yeah, in terms yeah. of how the kids wore their uniform and stuff like that so did you did you have a particular vision that that's yes. what the kids would look like almost yes. a very realistically to what yes. um my my senior school was where some kids didn't do their top button up on their tie yeah, and would yeah. just leave you know, it, it I, I you thought, know, I like thought that, that uh, to going back to your normal thing I thought that the kids should look normal which means that by normal that a lot of kids could recognize themselves into you, into the school, that it was not a foreign world, it was a world which was next to you, around you, but they had special gift. So although they were completely normal children, they were normal children with special gift, which was the, the idea that Alfonso and I developed to present Oguard like something which could be very near you and very reachable. And I had to express that in your costume, which means that I had to dress you almost normally, talking mm. about normal again, but you did have your little fantasy, your little <laughs> special thing. You didn't see the world the same way that somebody else was seeing the world. You did like hood and pointed and funny, difficult graphic design, and you had shapes that you enjoyed, which was not maybe the shape that everybody would enjoy, but that was your world. And that was very mm. important to show that that world was magical because it was fun and interesting and maybe not so normal after all, but you know, what is normal? Well, that's it. And I think especially like how the, even like the Quidditch uniforms, how that changed. Yeah. And yeah. you can kind yeah. of see like the development with that type yeah. of style. Again, it almost, yeah. to me, it took more of a, I suppose like a football, like a yeah, soccer yeah, style. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was. It was approach. football. That... It was. You know, you. It's, right. it's the team of Hogwarts, and whatever you fly on a boomstick to get the ball or you run, what's the difference? You still have to get that ball and you have to throw it. I mean, nobody. I never understood the Quidditch rules. I don't think you did. Either. <laughs> nobody did. It was much too complicated for us. Yeah. You know, they were flying. They were flying. Not remember on those very high machines, but you did have to put that ball somewhere. Let's put it that mm. way. And you had to do that flying on that broomstick, which was then a construction, remember, on top of a pillar like that. It was very complicated. But, um, yeah. yeah, so my inspiration was always modern shapes, nylon, football, things which were that the kids knew. And then from yeah. that on, giving it always a little magical touch, which means let go to our fantasy to develop it. But the, 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 the base of the design was always reality, contemporary reality, or even historical reality, but always putting it, making it accessible to a public of, I don't know which year it was then, to see it, enjoy it, and, and find some point relativity, to, to relativate with image that they knew, not something that you pick up in an historic book or in a book. No, the, your world was next door, and that was important. Mm. Yeah, I mean, is, is there a costume that stands out to you as your personal favourite, not necessarily from uh, like our characters, but in, on the whole spectrum of all the, the costumes that you designed on the Well, I love Beatrix. 
because she's a badgie, and I love badgies, you know, they're much more interesting <laughs> than normal people, get normal. <laughs> um, she's bad. She's very sexy bad, which we like. And then you in your suit. Your suit were amazing. Because I think the suit were completely fitting in that shop. You know, it was a shop, it was a suit, it was you, everything was like going up. And little shoulder going up, the stripe going up, your pointed shirt. I think it was brilliant. I really loved your suits and Beatrix, everything from Beatrix. But it's mm. funny because my fan for you are completely different than the fan I have for Beatrix. I've got all sort of SM group to follow <laughs> Beatrix. Yep, yep. <laughs> and then I have all sort of romantic following you. So that's very <laughs> different group. You know, they don't match. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, I, I, I never really thought about it that way, but I suppose yeah, there's um, yeah, there is that element too, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. Well, our, um, our our producer has got a few screenshots from the films lined up, um, and we don't know which outfit is uh, is something that you would say. Could you could you talk us through one or two of them at all, if uh, if we can show you them? Which so it's obviously like the. Um... <laughs> My gosh, you're so young! Look at you, you I know, babies! Yeah. I know, just a bit. <laughs> Yeah. I always remember it was the hottest day of the year when we filmed that as well. So we were really happy to be in um, woolly hats and everything inside a yes, soundstage. Yes, but don't you remember that Mama Mama was knitting? Ma Weasley is a great knitter. So she has been knitting those hats for you. That was the idea. And you were looking extremely cute with the pompons. Very cute. So yeah. I, really, I really love that. I really love that. And of course, the hood. And the hood, that is really the witchy details of you. And then the fact, and that is, if you look at the picture, how strong and powerful and above everything you are, even if you wear those silly hats, you know, your attitude mm. doesn't change. You do have an attitude. Huh? Um, you are wearing a silly hat. Who cares? We are we. Mm. That was great. Yeah. I think unless you've been in a situation, it's hard, it's hard to understand. But definitely the costume does help. For myself as, a, as an actor, it definitely helps me feel a lot more in, in role with the character. Yes, and like you said, giving them a bit more. Um, he's got like not. It's not even a rebellious costume, but it's just like a "this is who we are" kind of costume. Oh yes, that particular you, one especially. You were in in in, in Hogwarts, You were the popular guy. Do you know, you are. The kids loves you. The kids mm. look up to you, and and you wear silly hats, and they and they enjoy that. They are expecting you to be different. The, the, you remember your your place in the group was very much like, uh, you know, we cool, you cool. Yeah. So mm. you know you can you can afford a little bit of silliness because you're so cool. <laughs> yeah. Are you still like that? Really, I don't know if you're still. I like still that. stand by that. I don't know. <laughs> I'd, li I'd like to think so. I'd like to think so. I don't think I quite had the same uh, the same schwab as as those guys did with they when they came to you know portray what they what they wear and stuff. But you know when you when you joined. Um, Potter on the Prisoner of Azkaban. What was it? What was it like for you coming onto a? Because most of the crew were already established, as well as the cast. Was it easier because Alfonso was new as well, and you guys can kind of Alfonso just... took me in. It's Alfonso right. who took me in because uh, he, he wanted to, to, not to jazz it up, but to actualize it. He, he didn't want to have uh, maybe because I was French and. Mexican, so we, we had this thing together. He knew my work and I knew his work. And I don't think he wanted to have something cute. And he knew mm. I couldn't do cute. So I, I think <laughs> hey, that's why he took me. He took me also because I told him that I, I didn't like the sort of Christmas carol feeling of, of the film. Uh, I think the film should be, should be hard. I mean, this is a story of kids which have not difficulty, but because they are special, because they have gifts. First, they belong to a society which is a, a, a secret society, so it's difficult for a kid to belong to a minority, whatever minority it is. And then on top of that, they are gifted kids. So they are outsiders. And it was much more interesting to make a film about a story of kids which are outsider with difficulties to integrate in a normal society that was a much nicer subject that to do to make a Christmas carol you know with the snow mm. snowing on the back I don't know you know what I mean <laughs> so, mm. so we did that film and that's why Prisoner of Azkaban is a masterpiece yeah yeah 
I still, I still think it's probably my favourite Potter. To be oh, honest. it is, it um, is, it is, it is, it is. I, it's my favourite um, because it's very determining about the change of personality. You know, the kids going from childhood to teenager, it's it's a very difficult time. It's a key time yeah. eh, for all of for all of you because you were also puber. All of you were puber. Remember when we were talking about girls, you were all <laughs> giggling like that. Remember? I remember. Mm, mm. When, oh, and I the, don't and remember. The, I, of course, <laughs> you don't remember, but I do. And then, and then you had, and then you had all this little affair with each other. Who kiss who? who what? Remember? <laughs> uh, you, shush, was, you were really <laughs> puber, and then, and then you were puber playing puber with just one year mm. difference to make it a little bit easier. But mm. you were puber. And and I think that's why the film also is um, is the most interesting one because mm-hmm. it caught you on a very special moment of your of your life. Yeah, yeah and I, th- I always think because you're you're trying to, at that age you're still trying to work out who you are exactly yeah and what are you what are you doing what are you trying to you know, who do I want to be who, what personas do I want to put out so sometimes when you were so in our case when we were told right you guys can play the popular outgoing whatever attitude they have that was actually quite liberating for us because I suppose we were being, growing up we were quite I suppose reserved to an extent like being thought okay we'll, we'll keep it down a bit but whereas as, as you said earlier with their with their costumes for the um for that scene with the bubble hats they don't care they are they are they they, they are, are who they, they are. are they are who they are yeah I mean with their parents they, they, <laughs> they, they, yeah. they, they you got to really yeah yeah, yeah. but uh, uh, for you, for you as actor, it must have been also a difficult moment suddenly becoming so successful and having people recognizing you in the streets and and having all this fan mail. How was it for you? Uh, you were puber, just caught in that crazy successful uh, uh, trip. So how did you how did you cope with that? Was it easy? I suppose it, we were very lucky, obviously, because of our our family and friends were very keen to keep us grounded and, okay. and all that, like not remind us exactly, you know, where we are, and it's we're just how lucky we are yeah. to be in that position. But I get, I think because there was such a big cast of us going through a similar experience, no matter where you are from the world, you were all in the same boat when you came back to film. So it wasn't like anyone could ever get above their station because everybody else would would bring them back down so i think yeah. everybody kept each other in check which would definitely helped yeah you were very grounded as kids i remember that you're very very strong very sure mm. of yourself uh, not you were not attacked by the success of uh, you were staying yourself you stayed yourself all the time and that was something that i i remember and and appreciate you're talking about being grounded i remember that our uh in the fifth movie, our school trousers were from Harrods. I do. <laughs> I remember but that. But at that time, at that time, Harrods had the best department for um, for school uniform because they were selling uh, okay. sc- school uniforms. I mean, Sainsbury was saying polyester thing, which I didn't want because I thought that Hogwarts is a school with money, not that your family had money, but they had no, a school no. with money, it's a private school. Uh, yeah. And Harold's was having all the, uh, the, the, the school uniform from private school. So when I wanted to go and pitch some element, some interesting design department, uh, design element, I was going there and I could pick up different trousers, different shape of trousers, because I do wanted to mix uh, a certain classicism with a certain fantasy. Because if you start with a classical trouser, you can always make it fancy, you know, by making it too mm. short. By, well, but you have to start with a very good shape, and especially that we had to. F- f- we had to make thousands of them, you know, we had to yeah. put them in a factory. So when we had a good pattern to start with, and, and Harold was a, a good synonym of quality. Right, yeah, I, I never, th- I never I thought about people, that people, actually. Ne- neither, I did I, people... Marlo, neither did I, but I, just, I was just looking for, um, where can I find six shape of trouser from boarding school? And from boarding school, from, from classical school, and when I was going there, it was like, 
wow, Alibaba, you know, you had all those schools, different things, different shape of, uh, and that, that's where I got uh, the skirt of the girl, your trousers, your, uh, and then after yeah. that we were, we were manufacturing them, uh, don't know where, but... Uh, I was, I was going um, to say it wasn't like you. It wasn't like you walked into Knightsbridge and said, "I'll have six hundred of those." No, girls. no, 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 never, <laughs> never. You might have had a good one, but uh, all your colleagues, which were not in the front, <laughs> titling right, the other yeah. one, <laughs> the right. other one, they had the factory one, but based on yeah. your pattern. So, you know, yeah, okay, they had a little bit of parrots. They had the that... S of parrots. Let's put it. Up. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, so I, I guess that's the thing that people don't realize all that detail that goes into it because like a lot of Fred and all the Weezy stuff they were all made to look old and hand-me-downs like the oh. the school gyms had a had a hole or so in it the gowns yeah. the robes always had but like, they were really battered like well, how know, long would that I process know. take take you guys to do long long I mean I remember Ron and you because you were the same family you all had very expensive things that we were beating up <laughs> burning, mm. dirty, using, dying, because I always wanted to put a, a fantasy element in it. I remember a Dolce Cabana sweater, what you had, both of you, which was costing a yep. fortune, multiply <laughs> yeah. by 10, as everything you had, or six, or I mean, yeah, for you, five and five, so 10. And then putting it through a, a dirty yellow wash, and then after that, putting holes in it that we repaired, and that sweater, <laughs> You know, we already started at 400 pounds, going to 600 or 700 pounds with the work. Your, your, your costume were very expensive because yeah. it's, a, you know, like somebody said, it's hard to look so cheap, but it is really very difficult to look. <laughs> 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 to have well, shape that nobody else have. It's quite expensive. You were very uh, high yeah. maintenance, the Weasley twins. It's just showing one now when we're at the Quidditch World Cup, and it's like this, if you can see the picture there, of, like that type of look as well was very. Aren't you great? Aren't you great? Look I at know. that! Look at that! I remember they—they they were the comfiest trousers I've ever worn. I remember that. that we, was, uh, we, cool. we they were like flares kind of thing, weren't they? We we they were, and uh, I promise you, they they were. Those were expensive. Your t-shirt were not expensive. The sweater was expensive-ish, but the trousers were expensive. I remember that. And the color, yeah. I mean. And you know what was very difficult for <laughs> us? It was usually when we were not buying very expensive for you, we were buying the leftover that nobody else wanted. You know, like if you go to a shop and then they make the trouser in five color, it's always going to be a color that doesn't sell, like that yellow orange. And then we were, yeah. I was always picking that up for you. And so it was quite <laughs> difficult to, to get all the repeats that you needed because they were the one that people didn't want. So there were not so many of them and we had to go all around the world. I remember a, 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 a Gap sweater that you had and we had to go to pick them up, to pick all the repeats abroad, like like really abroad, like Asia, America, you know, to be able to get the 30 repeat that you needed. I cannot remember for what it was, but I remember a lot of repeat and we had somebody just doing that. Getting, getting the, the all those ugly bits. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> In the amount we, we we needed for you, but you look great, you know, and also the shape. I always I always wanted to accentuate your body, which was very long and thin, you know, like you, yeah. you grew, you shoot up, and then so this sweater uh, I I made smaller here to be able to have the the good uh, the good line the a good thin body and too long to have this dangling. I think it's brilliant. Those sweaters are brilliant. It was certainly, it was certainly a good look, actually. I think I always think that, like, especially when the, I suppose more so with the Weasley side of things, but certainly from the fourth film onwards, you you saw the more social side of the Weasley family. So I suppose there was more call to see them in yeah. civilian <laughs> outfits like that. But I remember I remember having a costume fitting on for one of the later films. I think it was the sixth movie. And I remember mentioning that well, Fred and George probably wouldn't wear the exact same colours anymore, being that they're older and they've left school and stuff. So I think from then on, they had pretty much the same outfits, but different colours. Uh, um, so cool. like, when, when an actor says that, does that help or hinder your, your process, your, your work? But I always, you're right, but I always have been trying to not dress you exactly the same, but complementary. 
Because I thought that yeah, your mother yeah. could never buy two things the same. She was so, you know, special. Mm. So I thought mm. she find a sweater yellow and red, and then she buys it for him in red and yellow. You know what I mean? So, so, so yes. I always try to find that it was a little bit different, looking alike, but different. But in those suits, by the time I thought, well, you are grown up, you have your own choice. So you keep the principle of Ma Weasley. You want to dress same style because you are so you are you are twins and you are so much like two person on one pod, and you are going to find to to buy yourself the same thing because you had that aesthetic training. So you will buy the suit with the same sort of stripe, trying to be mm. different but not succeeding in being different, and and yeah. those suits are. Perfect. And you remember the little M with the light going up and down? Yes. From, yeah. the, from your shop, you know that they are now selling them in the in the in the in the shops in the Harry Potter shop. But I think that little M with the light flashing that was a big thing. The props did that for us, and and it was quite complicated with the battery on the back. I mean, it was <laughs> my IG were always complicated, but but this little M was brilliant. Do you remember that M on your tie? Yeah, I remember, I remember w, they used to have to change the battery, didn't they? Oh, we, the battery. <laughs> when we were filming. <laughs> the battery. Make sure it was working. <laughs> Is that something which you ever have to bring into consideration, like the any any little props that need to go on a costume or sound department or anything, or do you expect them to work it around your designs? Uh, I wanted, I choose to ignore that sort of <laughs> difficult yeah. details, you know, because <laughs> if you start taking them in consideration, that's not fun. So I thought, oh, they managed. Yeah. They were brilliant and they managed. Look at that. I love the W. I love that. Yeah. I love your big <laughs> tie like that. I think it's fantastic. You look so cool. I mean, you look brilliant. It's funny. I still remember the design, how it was, let's you were saying, let's exaggerate all the, like the lapels and the shoulders and all that kind of thing. It was... It was such a different experience to what I've ever had having a suit fitting before, so it was <laughs> it was really fun. Oh, but you were good looking, and look at that, you're brilliant. And in the shop, it's fantastic. But the shop was amazing as well. Remember the shop with all the little? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. yeah. It was pro I, I think I still think it was my favourite set to film on. Yes. Just purely because there was so much going on, both internal and externally as well. But look at the balcony on the back with that red, yellow, orange. It's exactly the color of your suit. They were, they were really, it was simios, the two of them. It's brilliant. It's really, really, really good. I think that w while we were making those films, we didn't realize how brilliant we were. Luckily, because if not, it would have been unbearable. But mm. we, when I'm looking at it now, and I look just at that picture, and I see the set behind, and the color of your hair, and your haircut, and the tie, mm. and all the un ensemble. Come on, I mean, it's a poster in itself. Your expression, your, you're great, you're brilliant. It is brilliant. <laughs> I mean, what, what, going from changing slightly as well now on the fact of going from these suits to when you worked on uh, on gravity in spacesuits. Obviously, they're a bit different in terms of design bit, and stuff like that. But how much? How much creative freedom did you have on that type of thing? Well, yeah, a lot, because I, I felt like I was working for NASA because I had to design suits, and they're completely fake, you know. They, 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 they are not realistic at all because not so much the, 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 the Clooney suit. That was looking, that was almost a copy, but not really because I had to adapt it to his body because he wanted to have longer legs. Who doesn't? So I had to put up... <laughs> line a little bit higher but her Sandra's uh, uh, suit is completely a fantasy because though because it had to open in the front that she could get out of it yeah but, I suppose space suits are from the back aren't exactly they? yeah exactly so it was completely yeah. fake but um, when the film came out I thought nobody would see that and almost nobody saw it but some people were working in those somewhere, and it's a magazine which you don't read, I don't read, which is called a scientific magazine. Uh, I don't know what it's called. Peu importe. It's not the Daily Prophet. <laughs> and, the, and this magazine, very serious magazine, wrote a critique about my costumes. 
and they said that although that shoot was completely wrong because no astronaut will have blah 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 it was quite ingenious <laughs> they will remember I don't know which detail which for me was completely aesthetic a zipper there or thing there because it could help blah 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 something scientific I don't understand but that they appreciated more than me because for me it was a complete casualty based on how look she was in it, but for them it was quite clever. So you see. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Hey, well, I suppose, I suppose if you wanted to take a sabbatical from film work, you could always <laughs> pop over to NASA for a year and uh, help them out with the design. Please not. Please not. Please <laughs> not. That was a, a, a nightmare. That was really a nightmare. It was really a very difficult film to see. And everybody said, oh, two costume. I never worked so hard on that film. It was horrible. Mm. We had to do suit behind to constrain their movement because if not they will have gone like that so we had to yeah. do a suit behind with with some elastic to to stop to stop the actors to move normally that was alfonso wow. Rizzi, of course so you know to 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 not so they couldn't put the hand like that they had to put they had to pull up their hand very softly and their foot very slowly because because they were caught inside by all Rezo of, of, of elastic and oh, you don't want to know. Very complicated. Well, yeah. Very mm. complicated. Mm. And not the same white outside and inside. 16 different shades of white to get the same suit with a different light. Don't oh, even wow. talk about it. It's a no. nightmare. Wow. Nightmare. Nightmare. I much prefer your suit. That was easier. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit easier. <laughs> and, and more fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, going from. Like, I guess sticking with the suit theme, so then you obviously you've gone on and worked on Skyfall and Spectre. Um, I'm a huge Bond fan, so that was ah. really cool to see when... I enjoyed I always, it. I enjoyed it very much. I enjoyed could, could, Bond. I, I, I was wondering, like, so originally you may think, like, from someone looking in, you may think, well, Bond just wears a suit, but I know that you worked very... You, you, you put your own stamp on how the suit was... Yeah. Yeah, how he wore it. Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I really wanted the suit to be uh, very physical. You know, I, I wanted to be the, to the suit to to make one with Daniel's body. You know, because Daniel Gretz is somebody who walk, jump, and trains a lot. And the way he was playing Bond was very physical. He was using his his body. He was not using his smile. No, he was using mm. his body. He was running, and you could see the muscle where he was running. So I wanted a suit which was very, very fitted. And um, they made it brilliantly. We had three fittings, three or four fittings, because it was hard. But then they could see that it was sexier and sexier, and they could see that they were developing another market, you know, the guy being sexy in a suit. And uh, mm. and it worked and it worked. They were they were, but they did, they made them specially for me. It was not the the normal shape of uh, Tom Ford. He had uh, guys coming specially. I mean, the, the the cutter came from Italy, and then they were, and the Italian they like that sort of thing. So they 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 remade it for us. We work really we work hard on the suit, and then I wanted the yeah. tuxedo to be dark blue and not black. And then they sold, I don't know, 20,000 of dark blue tuxedo. Everybody was getting married in a dark blue tuxedo. Did you get married? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were quite happy about it. And then, um, fine, they loved me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, a, a, genuine, a genuine trendsetter then, in more than, uh, in more than that way, isn't it? No, it's, uh, but again, I think that, that type of thing, people kind of, I suppose, an ignorant person would look and say, oh, they've got a, a suit off a rack or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. But as you say, it's... It's exaggerating yeah. everything what's a, what's around it. But, so going back though, before you got into before before yeah, you got into the whole. Sorry, sorry James. Just, as I say, just to stick with. But obviously, they're not just looking at um, how Daniel Craig was dressed. But obviously, you you kind of brought in a new modern Bond girl look instead of them yeah. just wearing yeah. essentially like a bikini or something like that. It was it was very more modern thing. Was that yeah. something which you were yeah, what, told to it, bring in, it, or was that something which you you did yourself? Yeah, uh, together, you know. I, I mean, I did the two Bond that Sam Mendes directed, so um, he had an idea about uh, the new sort of Bond girl, and, and it had to be like that. You, you cannot anymore. Um, I mean, I don't know if you know that, but every single Bond girl died, and still right. they keep off having sex with Bond. 
They have sex and they die. They have sex and they die. You know, this okay. is the, the, the destiny of a blonde girl. And the only one who survived is the last one. She didn't die after having <laughs> sex with it. So that's, that's fantastic. I didn't see the, the um, uh, I didn't see the, 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 I'm going to see it. But, but uh, because she survived, <laughs> she had to be, in a way, I mean, one doesn't survive, one survives. She had to be stronger than the rest. And she's stronger because she has her own job, because she's a, she's a, 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 a woman, um, not a girl. I mean, what was the difference? Mm. She, she's, a, she's a woman, she has a job, she's clever, she's on the same level than he is. Sort of yep. gender e- equality between Bond and, and, and his girl, which make the whole story modern, I think. Mm. I'm talking about mm. uh, uh, Skyfall and Spectre. And Spectre. You know, they, the, yeah. yeah, especially in Spectre, the, the women are strong. I, yeah, M died, but you know she was a strong woman, and then after that, uh, yeah, I think I, I think you cannot you cannot have the same image of woman that you had in the seventy or in the eighty or in the ninety, because the women no, exactly. are stronger men, and then and then you have to show that, and then you have to be able to have a sort of e- equality between between Bond and his girls. And yeah, we, we made it. We made it. It's good. It's good. Uh, yeah. I think it's no, it uh, was the only way. The only way of to progress. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Well, well, I mean, going back to, I mean, going back to before any any film work or everything like that, you did. How would you how would you go back to your your normality growing up? Like, what would be, a, for example, a typical Sunday for you uh, that shapes or or stuff? What happened? What shaped your your direction and where you wanted to go and work? Uh, you know, first I don't believe in normality at all. Uh, I think that everybody is different. I think nobody mm. is normal. Uh, normal doesn't mean anything. Normal be that you belong to a certain society who is accepting you. But is being accepted something that important? I think creating your own world is more important than being accepted by the world. The world is mm. your world. You have to create that for yourself. You have to believe in what you believe. You have to believe in what you are. And in order of believing in what you are, you have to do what you like. You have to try to find out what, what's the kick, what you like, what, what, what you want to live for, and then live that way. Yeah, create your own world and keep to it. That's what I will, yeah. <laughs> I will tell you. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I wanted to become a costume designer. I became a costume designer. You wanted to right. be actor. You are actors. I mean, you know. I think it's you should follow your instinct. But sometimes it's not so easy to find your instinct. But yeah, yeah it's a part of growing up. What was it that made you want to get into uh, being a costume designer? I always then? wanted it. Always. From my four years old, I was dressing my dolls. I was having my playing with the dolls. You know, somebody was killing the other always, and the other one was pulling up, and then, and then, no, no, I always created little thing, do, did costume for that. It, it really, it looks very, very, very kitsch to say that, but I always wanted to become a costume designer, and I became a costume designer. I started with fashion, and then from fashion I went to cinema. Right. Boring, yeah. boring. <laughs> well, no, not really, because it shows, it shows, as you say, like you've got that, and were you very hands-on? originally in terms of like yes. the making of the costumes and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, I was very hands on. When I was at uh, school, university, um, I was making clothes for the people, selling them, I was doing, I was always in that. I always wanted to do that, yeah. yeah. But my, my parents were in fashion, so maybe that was easy. But, but it was not so easy because I started, uh, they wanted me to be a teacher because it was not, not fashion, was not a job. So I wanted to be a teacher, so I study, um, I got a master in French and then I used that to get into Elle magazine. I spent six months in Elle magazine. I fell in love with an actor and I started in film business. So, you know, wow. I went back yes. to what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to tell you that when you, when you really want something, you have to fight for it. And somehow it happened, but you have to, mm. you have to think this is what I want. Me is important. Yeah. And I suppose, yeah, especially to move you know. as well, like, Move, move countries to for work oh, and, yeah, and yeah, all that type of thing as well. It's what's a country? 
Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> what you, especially when you work in film. A country is nothing. A, a, a country... I change of country so many times. I, I don't have a problem changing country. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I set up my world, I set up my tent, and I set up my world uh, everywhere. I suppose I, I moved a country when I was 12, you know. I was born in Algeria, and then it was the French colony. It was not anymore a French colony, so I, when I was 12 years old, we moved to Paris. So because I did it when I was so young, I lost the world, and I created another world. I think it's quite easy after that. Yeah, I, I lived in Paris, and I, I lived in Holland, and from Holland I came to England, and... What's next? I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's a, well, that's that's a question, Johnny. What is next? What are you working on right now? I'm doing Game of Thrones. You understand? Cool. Because I have such a bad English presentation. Game. No, no, no. Yeah, we, get, you, no you, we understand. You, yeah, we're trying usually, to... Usually when so I say people say, pardon, you know, so... But you, you go, you go. Get, Game no, of no, Thrones. No, so I'm, in, uh, I'm in armors, yeah. I was going to say, so you're, and you're actually in the studio right now by the look of yeah, it as well. Yeah, I'm in the studio yeah. right away. I'm in Livzon. Remember Livzon where we did Right, the- okay. I couldn't get over how different it is, though, uh, when I went back to when, when we were filming. When we were it. there, it, it was the zone. You remember? We yeah. had this big yeah. bucket with the rain coming from the ceiling. And now yeah. it's like a small Hollywood. Do you know I've got a buggy? With my name on, and I go from A to B with a buggy. It's, a, I, it's not anymore the walk in the rain in the mud. I mean, yeah. it's still a little bit like that <laughs> on the back load, but basically, yeah. it's very glamorous now. They waited that we were gone to start building it. <laughs> well, well, I think that was it. I remember, we <laughs> I remember our very last scene filming. They had the uh, the bulldozers were literally the other side of the wall. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because the next day they were starting to rip the place down. The minute we left, they started making it nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we were used, you know, we dropped the rubber boots and bang, they started building. Yeah, I don't know, I know, I remember that. And I'm there now, that's where we are. And it's, uh, it's very right. big. But I'm finishing, um, I'm finishing soon. And then I start with Alfonso Cuaron. Oh, oh brilliant. Start, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, start, great. I start doing uh, yeah, six film with Alfonso. So you see. Oh, cool. yeah. Please say hello yeah. to him from I'm us. Very, I'm very faithful. Too. Uh, to you, to people, I'm very, very faithful. I always, uh, I always uh, love the same people. Keep them. Do you have good relationship with other people of Harry Potter? Are you still seeing them? Other actors or the... I think, yeah, yeah, I think for the yeah, most part, we. Um, it's the, the way that I always describe it to people is a bit like school friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. you, you've got some that you're really close with, and then they'll still be in contact, so you'll know what's going on with everybody else and things like that. Ah. Oh. It's yeah. funny. I mean, I see them occasionally. Sometimes mm. I meet somebody, meet Daniel or Emma. Emma, mm. uh, Emma I met when I was in Los Angeles. I saw her a few times. Or Ron, I meet somewhere. I, um, Rupert, you know, I meet uh, very yeah. occasionally. Occasionally. And yes. I always, you know, we, we were together in Orlando. It was so nice to see you, the babies. <laughs> I loved you. Yeah. I loved you. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think that's the thing as well. Like you see that for, because you haven't seen people for such a, a long period of time. In some oh, you know with whom I'm working. I'm working with Amanda, the makeup. Oh, right, okay, Amanda, Amanda. Nye. Amanda, and then we kept on talking about you and about uh, everybody. <laughs> and then I'm working with her daughter. Her daughter is one of the makeup girl, and she used to run around the studio four years old. Remember, it all yeah, yeah, pony, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. and she's now one of the makeup girl. Yeah, it's incredible. Wow. It's like another generation you know, going back. It is, yeah. So, I, I, Jani, I know that you're very uh, you're very giving of your time, but I know that you've got you've got a meeting mm. to be in. in but it's so in nice to while, see so. you. I enjoy it so much. <laughs> and you, if we could just finish, we've, we've got a couple more questions, if that's okay. Um, the first one is, I know you've already breezed on it, but what is the most normal thing about you? I don't know any, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that I can enjoy seeing old friends and talking with you. Maybe that's normal. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Is it? Yeah, I'd say so. That would be, and, and if that's the most normal, what would you say is the least normal? I think, well, I don't know, because everything in me is not completely normal. So <laughs> what's the worst of it? I don't know. I think you have to ask that to my friend or to my husband. Maybe they would be able right. to answer you more than me. 
<laughs> I think that's like I, over the whole series of when we've been able to speak to people like a bit like Blake Sajani is it's like where we found that like normality is pretty much your own world exactly yeah. that's that's your normal yes it's not you feel normal when you are in where. your world yes that's true exactly that's true. yeah exactly with yeah. people exactly. like you yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Jani what is your favorite book my favorite book oh my love is Proust À la recherche du temps perdu. I, I don't know what's the. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I think I found. I tried to. Ooh, 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 because I tried to find the title. Um, mm, Proust. Uh, Proust, and then it's a French. It's this book called À la recherche du temps perdu. I don't know what's the what's the English title of that, but that's my favorite. Okay, okay. I read that all the time. I read that all the time. You know, the story of somebody, the society there, his own thing. And also a guy talking about that. I mean, Proust was a gay man who was feeling completely... I like the story of outsider, people who don't feel completely, completely well in their own world and look at it and manage to survive and to become yeah. star in their own right because they used all what was wrong in them as a strength to approach other people and then get in their world from the outside, but conquest that world. That's what I love so much mm. in Harry Potter, actually. You know, the, and that's what I love so much mm. in the Weasley. And that's the same sort of things in uh, in Proust, because À la recherche du temps perdu is the story of a guy who is gay, Jewish, and evaluates in that French aristocracy and managed to become somebody that everybody appreciates. So I've just been I've just been told by our, by producer Alice that the English translation is in search of lost time. Et voilà, you said it better than me. <laughs> 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 so going from your your favorite book, um, what is your favorite film? Again, a French film. I'm sorry. Yep. I'm sorry. No, and no. it's called Les Quatre Cents Coups. It's a film of François Truffaut from the late fifties, and I think it's the Four Hundred Blow. So in uh, in in English, the title, Les Quatre Cents Coups, The 400 Blow, and it was a film, again, about a boy, a young boy, who tried very hard to survive, no parents, nothing, and create his own world. A little Harry Potter. That was that was my inspiration for Harry Potter. This, okay. this social family, oh, yeah. great film, black and white film, with... Uh, Jean Jean Pierre Léo plays uh, what was a, an Oscar nomination at that time, a French film from the Nouvelle Vague, who suddenly became, you know, opened the French Nouvelle Vague to the American cinema. Mm -hmm. You have to look at that oh. and, and translate. Yep, I'm gonna have to watch that now. Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah. Definitely gonna have to watch that now. Um, what is your favorite food? Uh, what the couscous from my origin. I love a good couscous. I love it. Mm. Yep. And your fav uh, favorite song? My favorite song is All You Need Is Love. Love it. Love it. Very that, good. That, was, that, was the, the, the mu the, that was our opening song in, 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 uh, in our wedding. All You Need Is uh, Love. I, 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 love I, actually, <laughs> I actually left uh, when, we got married, when I got married to my wife. We left the church and the choir sang All You Need Is Love. Ah, voilà. Isn't it yeah, a great song? All You Need Is Love. Fitting. And everybody, yeah. and when you, song, when you sing All You Need Is Love, everybody is singing with you, which is great. You stop, yeah. or you never, and you have three people saying, "Oh, you need to be on the background." It's great. Yeah, I mean, it was it, it kind of it was funny because there was other people in the congregation who were doing it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you have a better voice than me, but that's easy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Jani, what is your favorite quote? Tomorrow is another day. Very good. Very nice. I like that one. Very nice. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> well, Janet, again, thank you so much for your time. We, we really do appreciate oh, it. Was it. So nice. it was again. so nice. It was so nice. Really, it was so nice seeing you both. You look so good. You look so beautiful. Oh, mm. I love it. I love you. <laughs> and so do no, you. Thanks very much. Keep, keep up the good work, Janet. <laughs> bye bye, Les Chéries. Bye bye. Bye bye. How great was that? Very good. I mean, like I say, Jenny was always a great person when we were filming to you if you had any questions about the costume or anything to speak to because as you can tell she's very passionate about her job and very very good yeah i mean just some of the things as well that jenny was talking about there is obviously how potter um how they actually changed the way that people would wear their school uniforms as they got older 
And I was trying to think of like, did that ever happen at our school? And I just remember, can remember the tram lines? Yeah. What people put in their ties. So what people would do, right, so you've got your school tie and people, to make them look a bit different, they would literally pull a thread or two threads separate to each other and put it across their ties like that and then the teacher would tell you off and make you go and buy a new one. I've got to be honest, I never did it because I didn't go to my mum and say, mum, I need a new tie. You were never that bored in science, were you? No, not at all. I was too busy playing with Bunsen burners when you shouldn't be. Uh, but stay in school, kids. Uh, but yeah, there was, there was, I think stuff like that was really cool as well because it just shows how things evolve and how people kind of get their own. Some people are really conscious about dressing immaculately. Other people just chuck anything on and just go with it. Um, but it was nice to hear, though, how that came, came through as well on the films. Yeah, and how she always, like, just everything she thought about was very much for the for character driven as well. It wasn't just, well, you wear this because you're x y and z um so even down to the fact where miss weasley uh judy walters who's played our mum would sit there knitting woolly hats and then we'd obviously put in she incorporated those into the costumes and things like that to make it even more of a homely feel which i think you definitely can tell um because it's just very i don't know it's it, it seemed i always remember that the costumes that she had on whenever we went for costume fittings there was literally a huge rack of clothes so what the characters are wearing in a particular scene previous to filming you'd have gone for a costume fitting and that costume fitting would probably have taken two or three hours of seven or eight different variations of tops bottoms trousers you name it we tried it on and i think that was <laughs> people never believe this that the um house like the uh, hogwarts trousers were from harrods um and then like jenny was saying like we had a dng jumper which was a horrible thing as well, wasn't it? That one. I don't know how it they. Was too, it, it was definitely one of those things where they say, you know, it's fashion, darling, you'll be fine. And yeah. like, you've got to be really thinking good about yourself to wear said said sweater. But I did. I, I loved her quote that she came out with, which was, it costs a lot of money to look cheap. That was... <laughs> <laughs> no, it really did. It really did. But also, as well, like going on to the, the other important facts, and we, we touched on this a bit earlier as well about the whole identification of twins and things in terms of how um you know we, we we were able to put it forward to Jenny how they wouldn't dress the same when they got older how they wouldn't they'd have their own individuality it may look a bit similar but they wouldn't dress exactly the same and that's really got, I suppose just drawing from our own our own personal experiences really of growing up um that it's a case of well okay fine when your parents are dressing you maybe look the same mm -hmm. but when you've got your own individual choice then not many people are going to do that but and but what was again what's great about someone like Jenny is that how she kind of met everyone in the middle and mm. and she she like she said herself she believed she exactly she completely agreed with us as well mm. and so I think that it it's that's what you can tell in like so in the last two Potter films um, I know that we had those kind of like jackets didn't we they're like checked jackets and I had a a green and black and you had a red and black is that right purple and black. Purple and black, sorry. So you can, so just, just things like that, like just this, a slight difference, but it, it's great that you could, that you could, they look, they still, the characters still look the same ish, but you could tell they were different as well. Yeah, yeah, and just, to, I think it was great though that we didn't just stick to just talking about the time that we were filming uh, with her on Potter, but how she was able to tell us her experiences, obviously working um, on gravity and how they had to build elastic tensions into the actors' spacesuits to make it just look more realistically. So when they're moving, you know, in space, and it's it's kind of like these um, engineering ideas that maybe you don't necessarily associate with costume design that some people may just associate costume designers right it's something that the character wears and that's it as opposed to it actually serves a purpose not only for the the visual side of it but obviously as well it may i don't know but it may have made the actors feel a bit more in an alien environment that they're out of their their normal elements as it were so that was really exciting and, and interesting listening to that yes and especially and and then obviously going on to the her time on the bond films um I never, you never, I, for some reason, I just assumed that uh, James Bond had a standard tailor made suit and that was it, but not to the degree of that they actually manipulated the way the suit was put together to, um, for it to work. That was very interesting. And also, uh, obviously, the era that she came into the Bond movies, it was when the Bond girls came into a new being where been seen in the series, I guess. It wasn't, they weren't so much but well, now they're more of bonds equals whereas before they weren't so much so 
Um, I think it's very interesting as well how just helping with the characters in that regard really propels the idea even more visually. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so yeah, just so, just to round that up, thank you so much, Jani, for your lovely insight, your lovely conversation, and it was great being able to speak to you again. And we're sure that every one of you guys listening at home or watching at home or, or wherever you're listening to it right now enjoyed it as well. So, James, um, just getting on to one thing. So, obviously, you normally have your Did You Know Facts. Yes, I have a couple right here. Right, okay. So before I get on to that, I was doing a, I was doing a cameo calls the other week and a few of the guys who I was speaking to were telling me about this part of the segment of the show and asking about, you know, well, I've got some Did You Know Facts or something for you. And and Laura, right, she was currently in isolation um, or at the time she was in isolation due to having, having uh, COVID. Uh, so she actually came up with a fact and I've, I've never heard this before, but it seems to be quite a thing. And it's, did you know the brain named itself. Yeah, of course it did. Yeah, I know, but I've never. Yeah, if you, you put the two together, that's quite that's quite an interesting thing because there's nothing else that names itself, is it? Okay, the eye saw itself in a mirror. Yeah, but it didn't name itself though, did it? it didn't determine <laughs> what that is. Okay, that's a pretty loose fact. That one. Do you know? I think. Well, I, was, I did a bit more. I did a bit more reading into it, right? And. Um, and actually, it's a Greek philosopher, Aristotle, basically thought the brain was simply a radiator that kept all things important uh, from energy overheating. There you are. Can there I give you, you um, some other did you knows? Go on then. So since it's with Jenny, I thought I'd look at clothes and things like that. Again, Oliver, if you're going to do did you knows, they've got to be kind of tie into what I'm just, hey, 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 hey. I'm just saying brain. what Laura said. I'm just saying what Laura said to me. And you've got to remember... Given her, her situation at the time and isolation, she may have been just crawling at the walls a bit at that point. <laughs> Shout out to Laura if you're listening, by the way, Laura. Yeah, Laura, actually, that was, that was a very good <laughs> Your input is, is valid. It is valid. No, honestly, I, do you know, though, that's the kind of thing that you would just throw at a dinner party. Or well, that would be a good um, quiz question, wouldn't it? What? What named itself? What, name, what part of the body named itself? There. Pub quiz question. Right. On to my digi knows. So, since we're talking to Jani, I thought I'd do digi you knows about clothing and the histories of clothes, all that kind of stuff, right? So, mm -hmm. first of all, did you know? Think old school um, swimsuit, right? Specifically for females mainly. Okay. Right. So, in How old 19, school? well, nineteen oh seven. Okay. So right. you know, you know when you see like the. Um, old-fashioned drawings of people at the seaside and they'd be in like a onesie with stripes yep. on. Yep. Right. So in 1907, there was an Australian swimmer and performer called Annette Kellerman and she was on a beach in Boston and she was arrested for wearing one because it was deemed too... too fitted. Right? But... Then eventually, it kind of came the norm. People enjoyed, like, started wearing them on the seaside more and more. And everything was going fine. Until the Miss World Contest in London in 1951, when the bikini was worn for the first time. Mm. And it was deemed a sin by the Vatican. It was also banned in certain countries, <laughs> such as Belgium, Italy, Spain, and ironically, Australia. Which is amazing, really, when, when you think that a lot of those countries, not so, well, there are parts of Australia that would do it, but where just like nudism on the beach is just a, a done thing that goes on. Mm -hmm. But yet you put a little bit of underwear on or a little bit of bikini. And that's that. And so, uh, so then, anyway, going away from being at the seaside and clothes that you wear at the seaside, did you know, so Napoleon, right? Hmm. Little man who, in history, he wasn't actually as small as everybody makes out. But anyway, the old emperor of France. He decided that he had would have brass buttons sewn onto the sleeves of his soldiers on their uniform to discourage them from wiping their noses on the uniform. Really? Uh-huh. Wow. Oh. Oh, and, no. did you, so, there you go, you see, that's I've nothing got, to... I've, 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 got, I've got a related did you know for you. Gone. Did you know in France it's illegal to name a pig Napoleon? It is. I didn't know that one. Mm. 
<laughs> and di- okay, here, all right, here's one then. Here's a here's a little question. Did you know? Oh, okay. Can you tell me? Can you tell me the first ever designer logo? What is in clothing designer? Yeah. So you think of logos, and you so from ni- in 1933. 33, okay, it's going to be something like Hugo Boss? Nope. What, Boss? Well, it's Hugo Boss at the time. <laughs> um, although we won't, we won't talk about what they were doing at that time of day. You okay, come on. About the show. Anyway, right, um, anyway I'm going to... Oh, yeah, go, yeah, go on, go on, I don't know. So the first ever logo designed by a fashion company was Lacoste. What, the crocodile? The little crocodile, the little crocodile that was the first ever logo on clothing. There you are. There are my random did you know facts. Hmm. That's very good, isn't it? That's very good. Well, look, I mean, there's there's lots of stuff what goes on about on the uh, on the podcast as well, and obviously people are getting in touch and sometimes listening to stuff. So I'm, no doubt someone has listened to the show today and thought I've always wanted to try my hand at costume design, and after listening to Jani, maybe they'll explore that field a bit further. So if you are thinking that right now, feel free to do so. Um, but I was chatting with Haley as well, and Haley was telling me how she listened to the podcast episode from the last season with Mercedes Vinaldo, and she was saying that how she actually listened to that, she actually got into watching, uh, especially Mercedes perform in the WWE, and her dad also really also known as, as well. Sasha Banks also known as Shasta Banks is her, her stage name. And the she's actually got into watching it with her dad now. And they actually went together as like a, a father-daughter day out uh, to see it live. And that all that, that whole interest came from watching uh, or listening to the show, our podcast episode with her. So I was very, very happy to hear that, that we were able to unite, um, unite um, Hayley and her dad's interest in something mutual, which I'm very, very happy to hear. So, yeah. Feel free to pursue anything that you hear on the podcast, you know, all in all things. Very much so. And also, I, a little, little random story. I was uh, visiting some pals a couple of weeks ago, and I was out walking the dogs, and two people, stopped, well, a family stopped me, and a mother and daughter, and they were saying how they both love listening to the show, love listening to the podcast. Um, so, Annabelle, Pip, it was lovely to meet you the other day, um, and I hope you have an amazing rest of the year and thank you very much for all your very kind words about the show and everybody involved it really did make my day here and that's thank you so much exactly exactly and also uh, while, we, while we're talking about interacting with people and speaking to people like that i was out for a meal the other day and the waitress casually said at the very end of my as i was getting it to leave said how come you don't rant too much anymore and i looked at her and i was like i, I don't know do you want me to do you want to do one right now? Um, but this got me thinking, right, why is that not happening? And it's, I've kind of put it down to two things. One, it's a conscious effort not to talk about it, not to go on a random rant about things. But also, I think it just became a bit too much last season. Did you? Very much so. Yeah. Although, although that being said, why is it, right? You know, when you get to, so I was getting into wrapping presents and, and stuff over the Christmas period. And why is it, right, that you've got certain levels of wrapping paper. First of all, you wrap it, you bin it, it's gone. Second of all, you can spend a lot of money on wrapping paper, which again is just thrown away. Or you can buy really cheap wrapping paper, which is rips when you're trying to cut it yourself and put it on there. Just throwing it out there. Maybe maybe use newspaper if anyone has a newspaper these days. Don't know where I'm going yes. with this. Don't no, know I don't. Anyway, no, thank you very much it. for not having a rant anymore. I think that's why. I I'm losing my touch. I'm losing my touch. Anyway, guys, whatever it is you're getting up to this week, stay safe. Uh, look out for one another. And thank you for joining us. And also, obviously, your interactions with us. So thank you so much once again for listening to the Normal Not Normal podcast. And remember to keep sending your story times, your questions, and your did you knows to the normal address, which is normal not normal podcast at gmail.com. That's normal not normal podcast at gmail.com. Yes, and if you've enjoyed this episode, please remember to tell everybody about it, that you've enjoyed it. Um, and I'm going to have to say it this week, aren't do I? Do it, do it. Please remember to like, subscribe and review. That sounded really sincere, didn't it? Yeah, I know. Gosh, what was that? You need to, wow. don't, are you supposed to do the, hey guys? No, I don't. Go on. Honestly, thank you very much for all the interaction with everybody. Like Olive said, if you want to get involved, send us an email and... We'll try and um, answer them on the fan interaction show. One of them coming next week. But until then, I've been James Phelps. Thank you very much, Annie, for joining us this week. 
And I'm Oliver Phelps. Guys, stay safe and we'll see you next week. Slam.